What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we are going to be going over Macros Part 2. So in this episode, we are going to cover macros for Player 1 and Player 2. In the previous episode, we only had Player 1 working, and we only had one macro working. In this episode, we're going to allow both players to be able to use macros, and we're going to set up multiple macros for each player. We're going to do some additional logic as well to fix up the input stack in practice mode so that the macros can display the right images for the inputs pressed or entered and a few other additional fixes and updates to the macro system so in this case i now have two macros so i'll have one macro that will do the x light attack for me and i have another macro that will perform the throw for me okay i can perform this with 100 percent accuracy using these macros of course, I can actually press the standard buttons to perform it. There, I was pressing two buttons to perform my throw, and here I will press two buttons to perform my X light attack. And see, I was able to pr press them and do them correctly to the point where I was able to get it with good precision, but the macros just make that easier. Now, if I go to player two, I can actually press these buttons as well if I remember which ones they are. Here we go. So this is the X light attack for player two macro. And here's the throw for player two macro. Take note that these macros don't have to be bound to the same inputs. So player one and player two could have different macros or or macros bound to different inputs. So player one may have throw and X light attack, whereas player two might have, you know, a different type of X attack and then a different command entirely. It doesn't have to be related to the throw or anything. So they can be separate entirely. Right now I have them as the same but we'll get more into the customization when we add it to the input controls remapping menu and incorporate that back into our game. Okay, so with that said, we can go ahead and get started. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys for all the love and support over this past year. I really, really am grateful and I can't wait to see where we can bring this series in the future. So for those of you that want to get caught up in the series and everything we've done, this is episode 153 of the fighting game tutorial series. We still have a long way to go, but we've made a ton of progress so far. We have an episode every week. So if you want to get caught up, here's the playlist in the top right corner. I'll show you everything we've done to reach this point in the series. Now, alternatively, if you don't care about this specific series, but you do care about macros, I'll link you to this episode right here, which is part one of macros. So you can see what we set up that we're going to be building off of today. Okay, and now we can go ahead and get started. We're going to begin in the code today. That is where a lot of our logic is going to be taking place. Specifically, I would go to our base game instance.h. If we scroll down, in the previous episode, we had made one variable that I called p1 macro inputs. And this stored all the inputs bound to the individual macro for player one. In the case of the previous episode, we only had one macro and it was only working for player one. But now I've changed things a bit, so I had to rename it. So instead of it being called P1 macro inputs, I've called it P1 macro one inputs. Note that we also have a P2 macro one inputs, P1 macro two inputs, and P2 macro two inputs now. I've commented them all so you can see what they, they're relating to. But essentially, for every macro we have, we need to bind it differently. So we need to have a separate variable. A lot of games will have a specific number of macros that each player can have. And in this case, we need to keep track of all of them. So I'm going to say two macros per player is probably good for our game. You can add as many or have as little as you want. And so I'll probably keep two, but I want to make sure player one and player two have their own bindings. And I'm putting it in the game instance so we can set it in a widget in a, in a menu, like the remapping controls menu, assign the, the inputs that the macro is bound to, and then it will store between games, between sessions, all that good stuff. So I would rename this variable, if you haven't already, from P1 macro inputs to P1 macro one inputs. Then what I would do is go into all your other classes where it's used, such as the base game instance, and change it here. So P1 macro input should be P1 
P1 macro one inputs everywhere that it was used before. That is in the base game instance.h, base game instance.cpp, and we also use it in the fighter template character.cpp as well. Okay, so in the case of the previous episode, you'll have to update your for loop to be p1 macro one inputs. Then where we call perform input logic, we want to use p1 macro one inputs index i. And in release macro one, we want to use p1 macro one inputs. Again, in the press, the perform input logic, we want to use p1 macro one inputs. Okay, we're going to go over the changes in these these functions very soon. But what I'm trying to get at here is you should make sure that you can compile your logic before adding these other ones in. Make sure that the one we had from the previous episode is working. So I'd rename this everywhere that you used it to your new name, P1 Macro 1 Inputs, or whatever it is that you call it. Once you do have the one from last episode working again with the new name, we can now set up all the future ones, and they're all going to work the same way. They're just named slightly differently depending on if it's for player one or player two and what macro index it is. So if you haven't already added them, let's add them now. We wanna have the same thing as the first one. We're just gonna copy it for as many macros as we want and then double that since we have one for player one and one for player two. So you can copy this and paste it if you'd like or rewrite it every time, doesn't matter. And you can set them up like I have them here. Once you've made these variables in the base game instance.h, let's go into the base game instance.cpp and set them all up as you'd like them. So I set up player one macro one first, as I showed you already, and then I set up player two macro one. Then I went into player one macro two and player two macro two. Make sure as you do this, all of these variables are the correct ones. So where we're setting p2 macro 2 inputs dot set num then the array should be p2 macro 2 p2 macro 2 don't copy and forget to change one of them they all have to be the correct values here like i said you can change them they don't have to match right player 2's macro 2 could be different from player 1's macro 2 i just made them the same right now for ease and you'll see more of that in the next episode but feel free to play around with it while you're in here if you'd like once you have this set up, we're good to go in the base game instance. The next place we have to go is back to the player controller. So if you go to your base player controller.h, you can scroll down to where we made the macros in the last episode. So I had made functions call press macro one, call release macro one. Now in this case, you actually don't have to change the names because this is what I called it. Each player will have a player controller. So we don't have to separate player one and player two here we can just have a function call press macro one, call release macro one. So these functions aren't gonna change. However, for every macro we have for each player, we do need to add a different one because each macro is gonna be bound to a different input. So we could have one macro bound to the three key, one macro bound to the four key, and that's what I've done. Okay. So just make functions for each of your macros. Again, I have two, so I made another call press macro two and call release macro two. Did make them blueprint callable so we can call them in the base character for that keyboard mode. So if both players are playing on the keyboard, they can still perform the actions as expected. Perfect. Once you're done with the base player controller.h, go to the base player controller.cpp and we're gonna go to setup input component. Now in the previous episode, we had a binding in here for macro one and we had the press and the release. I've now changed the name in the project settings. So let's go into the editor, go to edit project settings, then go to input, go to your action mappings and look at where we have macro one. So macro one that was the name before this episode. I've now changed to macro one P one. Remember if both players are playing on the same device, such as a keyboard, we do need different controls for player two on a standard system. If we're using two controllers, 
then they can all use macro one P one here, or you can actually just call it, you can leave it macro one. You don't have to separate it and call it P one. I'm just differentiating them. This is macro one P one. Okay. Player one is using the three key on the keyboard, but again, you can add a gamepad input here in both players on their controller on their gamepad could use this binding. For the cases where we have multiple players on each keyboard, we do need them to have P2. So I've just been very specific about that. So I have macro one P1. This is the the action mapping from the previous episode. Then I've gone up to the top and added three new action mappings. I have macro one P2, macro two P1, macro two P2. Macro 1P2 and Macro 2P2 are for keyboard mode. However, Macro 2P1 is one you'll have to add anyway if you're going to have more than one macro. We do need a different input bound to it regardless, so we're going to need to add these. If you did rename your action mapping like I did, make sure you change the name in Setup Input Component. So instead of just Macro 1, I called it Macro 1P1 now. The rest of these two lines here can stay the same. Just make sure that this name lines up. The other one we need to add in the controller is the macro 2p1. Okay. Because this is going to be relevant regardless if we're on keyboard mode or two different controllers. This is an entirely separate macro. So you can copy these if you want and just paste it. And you're going to change it to macro 2p1 for press and release. And then we need to change the function that we're calling as well to our new functions call press macro 2, call release macro 2. So I'm going to close out of the project settings here, but you can see everything that I've got. Now we're going to go to our call press and call release macro buttons. So if we scroll down, we have call press macro one, call release macro one. These are the same as they were in the previous episode. We need to copy them and make new functions for the second, the second macro. So we have call press macro two, call release macro two. And they're essentially the exact same as the above function. The only thing that's different is we're going to call a different function on the character, press macro two and release macro two. And I think that makes perfect sense, right? We, we have the controller calling a different function to relate to the specific macro that was pressed. You won't have these functions yet unless you went off and made them on your own. So we can take a break here. We can go into the fighter template character or your base character dot H and we need to make these functions now as well. So if we scroll down. We had press macro one, release macro one already. Of course, I've just added two new functions, press macro two, release macro two. Once you have these functions in the fighter template character dot H, we can go to the fighter template character dot CPP and we can go down to them. I'm going to scroll down. You can search for it and find it as well. There's a lot of lines in this file. Perhaps more than I considered. We've done a lot in this series. But anyway, now you have press macro one and release macro one. Now these were both made in the previous episode, but they've changed quite a bit. So we'll have to go over them again. What I'd recommend doing right now is just making these two new functions, press macro two and release macro two. If you make them and just add a starting and an ending bracket, it will function as a function. <laughs> it will work, right? And as far as the uh, code is concerned, it is set up correctly. It just won't do anything. I'd recommend doing that so there's no compile errors. And then once you make those functions, you can go into the base player controller.cpp again. And now you can officially call uh, press macro two and release macro two on the possessed pawn, which is our fighter template character. I recommend doing that so we don't have to come back and forget about this. We can have our base player controller finished and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Because once we're done with our game instance, our base player controller, and then can just work in the character, then they'll be less confusing. We can just add the, the functionality to these functions that we have and finish up our logic. So now let's go back to press macro one in our fighter template character .cpp. So press macro one is what happens when we press the input or the button that is bound to macro one for this player. 
in the previous episode, what we were doing is this. We were getting the game instance. Then we were calling a loop to loop through our only macro logic right here. And then we were calling perform input logic on that macro's input with the status of press. So essentially, if the macro is bound to light and medium attack, then we loop through all the inputs on the macro, light and medium, and call perform input logic on both of them. Then I had a commented outline where we were adding the input icon to the screen. And we didn't have a way to pass the correct input stack icon to the widget. So the wrong input stack icon would display if we tried to use the, the method before. So I just had it commented out. What we're going to do today is change it to where, depending on if we're player one or not, the logic changes for which macro we're using. And then we're also going to add the input stack icon to the screen. So let's start at the top again. So we check if the game instance is valid. As long as this is valid, we know we can continue. So before we go into the for loop, I've now added an if statement, is player one. Is player one is a Boolean I've set up on the fire template character that gets assigned when it is spawned so that it knows if it's player one or player two. This is important because we need to know what macro inputs we need to grab so that we perform the right action. If player one and player two have different inputs bound to their macro one, then this could call the wrong action and perform the wrong inputs if we don't check if we're player one or player two. So we check if is player one. If it is, we basically do the same logic we were doing in the previous episode. In fact, you don't have to change anything with this except for the input icon. For now, you can leave it commented out. We'll cover the input stack icons at the end. So you can leave your line commented out for this. The important part right now is that you have it like this. Else, if it is not player one, we need to grab player two's inputs, okay? So this is what we did in the previous episode and we were grabbing player one's macro one input. If we are not player one, we need to be grabbing player two's macro one inputs. So in the else, we do the same for loop that we did above but we change the array we're pulling from. We're using player two macro one inputs. Then in perform input logic, we need to also use player two macro one inputs, index i. Again, you can leave this commented out for now. I'll talk about that when we're done the rest of the logic in these functions. Now let's scroll down to release macro one. Again, this was set up in the previous episode and what we had in here was this if statement to get the game instance. And if it was valid, we were just looping through P1 macro one inputs and performing the release action of P1 macro one inputs at this index. This is still valid. However, it's only valid again if we're player one. So add another if statement that encapsulates this for loop, right? If we are player one, we want to use this for loop macro p1 macro one however else if we're not player one that means we're player two so we want to grab p2 macro one inputs and then add the release input logic for p2 macro one all right so we're just updating the press and release functions to support player one and player two they don't have the add input icon to screens in the releases here like the presses do because we don't show input stack icons when we release an input currently, only when we press, and that's by design. So we don't have to actually add any icons here. So the release is simpler than the press. Now at this point, you could actually copy your press macro one and release macro one and paste their, their logic into the corresponding functions. So you could copy press macro one and paste it inside press macro two, because it's actually the exact same function the only difference we're doing is we're changing where we're grabbing the inputs from. So press macro two, we still get the game instance, we still check if we're player one, and then we grab player one's macro two inputs. When we're calling perform input logic, we use player one macro two inputs index i. 
Then we add the input icon to the screen. Again, this would be commented out right now. That's fine. Else, if we're not player one, we go to player two, macro two inputs. I then call player two, macro two inputs. And again, we're going to add to the screen, but we're going to comment that out right now. Lastly, we have release macro two, which you can also copy the release macro one and paste it in here. We're going to get our game instance, check if we're player one. If we are, we're going to use P1 macro two inputs for the release. Else, if we're player two, we're going to get P2 macro two inputs and pass that in for the release. All right, that was a mouthful, but now we have all that done. So the last thing we need to do is fix up our input stacks. That way we can display the correct icon when we are in practice or training mode and we want to press the macro and see the inputs that it's bound to. So if we go to press macro one here, we can go ahead and uncomment out these lines that were previously commented out. Okay, so I'm going to comment out both the player one and the player two lines for this. Press macro one, add input icon to screen. The function call we were passing before, I had a hard-coded number. I think I put like three or seven in here or whatever. It wasn't bound to anything. What we actually can do is something crazy that you might not have seen before. And I'll explain this. We can actually take the game instance P1 macro one inputs, or really whatever array we're using here. In the first case here, it's macro one and for player one, so we're using P1 macro one inputs. We can actually take this value right here at the index we're on, so the specific input that we're on for this macro, we can convert it to an integer. Okay, so we can convert an enum value to an integer and pass that along as the index. Add input icon to screen, takes in an index, it grabs an index of the icon from an array that we have in the blueprint. I'll go to that in a few minutes. And it grabs the correct icon from the array and displays it to the screen. Well, if we go to our base game instance.h and we look at our e input type, e input type colon u integer 8, unsigned integer 8 bytes. So this enum, every value here is technically bound to an integer. e none is index 0, e forward is index 1, e backward is index 2 so on and so forth. So what that actually means is that these enum values have an integer that they are mapped to already. You could make a separate map and say, oh, this enum is this icon, but technically the enums come with a built-in mapping system, right? Their integer value can be used to grab the appropriate icon from the icon array that we have. And so in all these add input icons to screen, we can cast to an integer and pass in the correct or the current index of the array we're looping through. And we can actually get the icons to appear on the screen correctly. So one more time for P1 macro one, if we pass that in and cast it to an integer as the arguments for this add input icon to screen, we will get the correct icon assuming the array is set up in the same order. Currently, we have not set up the array in the same order. So I'm going to do that live with you when we get into the blueprint. But for now, we can still set up this logic. It'll just display the wrong icons currently, but it will be consistent. So make sure you uncomment these calls now and just make sure they match the array that we're looping through. So P2 macro one inputs, that's what we want to grab and cast to an integer to pass into this function, P2 macro one inputs. If we scroll down to our press macro two, we can uncomment these functions. And we want to make sure that we're using P1 macro two, P1 macro two. And for the last case, we want to use P2 macro two, P2 macro two. Once we've done this, all of our macros will display icons when we're running the game. So if we go into the editor, go into practice mode, and let's load up a stage. I'll skip the stage intros and the character entrances. And now you can see as I press buttons, icons get added to the screen, right? Okay, great. 
Well, now what we have to do is if we press the macro, we want to see these. So I'm going to clear the screen a bit. Okay, I'm going to do all downs. There we go. So now I'm going to press the macro. And you're going to see it added two inputs. It added bottom left, bottom right. All right, I've reset everything. I'm going to press the other macro now. It actually adds the X attack, the, the backward left and the X attack icon to the screen. So it's adding the appropriate amount of icons. It's two inputs for each, but they are the wrong icons. That is because we don't have the same order in the array. Player two should be able to do the same thing. You can see it does. It adds the two icons that it did for player one when they use that macro, and they're just the wrong icons, but it's consistent. And then when I press the other macro, it also adds those icons again. So you can see that it's working. We just need to fix up the order. So there's two things we need to do still. We need to go into our base character BP and set up the keyboard mode updates. So if we go into our event graph, just like you did all the other input actions for keyboard mode, we now want to add macro 1 P2, macro 2 P2 input actions to our base character BP and set them up the same way and just call the correct functions. Now, you can look at your other cases like crouch, block, and copy them and paste them if you want, but I'll go over them quickly. So if you right click, you're gonna search for your new input actions that are specific to keyboard mode, okay? So two players on one device, and that is input macro one P2, okay? I actually already have it here, so no need to put it again, but you got that. And then input action macro two P2. Once you get both of them in here, you're going to have these red nodes, these input action nodes. Now what we need to do is we have a player two reference that is basically the controls for the second player on the same device. I get that variable, I right click on it, and I convert it to a validated get. This is so we can check if it's valid or not valid. Only if this is valid do we want to be able to perform the actions bound to this event. So in all four of these cases, you see on a pressed and a release, I get player two reference and convert it to a validated get. Only if it's valid in all four of them do I go any farther. Then what I do is I drag off the player two reference, get controller, to grab the player controller that is associated with it. I do that for all four of these. You see them here. Okay. Then I cast the controller to the controller type that we care about, which is the base player controller, because that's what should be possessing them during keyboard mode. So all four of these could cast a base player controller. Now, the only part that's different on any of these is that the function that we call. So if the input action is macro one for player two, and it's a press, the top branch here, then we want to call press macro one. If it is a release, we want to call it call release macro one. Same with macro two P2. If it's a press, we want to call press macro two. If it's a release, we want to call release macro two. To get these functions, they're on the controller. So you can either drag off of the base player controller like this and type call press macro one, call press macro two, and call release macro one and call release macro two. Or you can remove context sensitive and search for call press and call release. Either way. I like having context sensitive checked a lot of the time, so I'm going to drag off my base player controller and search for them individually. But once you connect them and make it look like this, then these macros will also work on keyboard mode, not just controller. But multiple players can play on one device and have macros bound now. Now, the other thing we need to do is we need to update P1 add input image and P2 add input image. There are two functions that we made for the input stack. So if we go into each of these functions, you're going to see that there's an index that gets passed into this array and it grabs an index or, or gets the value from the array at that index and adds that to the input stack. The way this is going to work is we let's take a look at where this function is called from, right? So if we right click and find references on it, you can see that it's here and it's called here. This is called from add input icon to screen. This is the function we were calling in the code, right? If we look down at this, add input icon to screen. Perfect. So this is called and the index that we pass into it is the index that goes into our functions we were just looking at. 
P1 add input image and P2 add input image. So essentially, if we just get the this array matching up with the index that we're passing into this array, we will get the proper icons, input stack icons, to appear in the practice and training mode. Right now, I have some random values, right? I have them here, but they're not really specific to anything. If I want them to pop up correctly, I need to map them correctly, right? To fix this, I can go into the code and I can go into base game instance.h and I can map each of these. I can I can reorder the things in the blueprint to match this enum. None is zero. So right off the bat, we're going to add one. We're going to have no image and we're going to put it at the top, zero. Then we just want to match them from here. It's super simple. So we have forward, backward. So we should add forward, which is going to, we're going to assume all these are from either side, right? Okay, so we're going to move these here where index one is now facing right. Index two is facing left. Let's go back in here. We have jump, forward jump, backward jump. So jump is going to be vertical. That needs to be the next one. It's actually already here. Forward jump I had as index 11. I'm going to move it to index four. Backward jump is going to be moved right under that. Now we have crouch, forward crouch, backward crouch. Okay, so crouch should now be next. And we should have forward crouch and backward crouch. And the way I'm moving these is I'm just pressing where I have these dots on the left side here and just dragging, clicking and dragging. Now we have block and throw. So block I have here. Throw I actually don't have an input for, believe it or not. So you can add one if you want. Like I can choose these inputs here or I can have a separate one. What I'm going to do is actually use, let's use the green as the throw because I already have it in here. So green's a throw. Then we have light, medium, heavy, and special attack. So light, medium, heavy, and special. They're already ordered correctly. And then X attack. Right now, I only have one X attack enum. All, they're all going to display the same image, but I do have some additional images I could bind as well. So now they're actually set up in the right order for player one. Okay, so if I am to go into my practice mode, and it doesn't even matter if I pick other characters or not, I can just start it out like this, and I can use my macro. Now, the macro for this is light and medium, which is displaying correctly. The macro for the throw is light and heavy, which is also displaying correctly, because that's actually what it is. We don't have the throw, as, as I was saying, we don't have the throw as an actual action in here. So I bound it in here, but we're not really using it. We're using light and heavy, and that just happens to correlate to a throw. We don't have a specific throw button. So that's intentional. So at this point, the they're working for player one at input image. This icon image array is actually a local variable in each of these functions, if you set it up the same way I did in the series. So if we're doing that, your P2 add input image, icon image array will be different. You can either go through the process of uh, mirroring it, you know, and, and changing it like you just did for player one, or you could copy the setup here. If you right click copy on the icon image array under default value, you can then go into the player two and paste it here and it will paste and change everything for you so you don't have to set it up again so now if i come in here and go for player two player two is going to be able to perform these macros and you'll see the throw is light and heavy that worked and this should be light and medium which also works so now the macros actually add the correct input stack icons Okay, now the thing you might notice is as you're doing your other moves, they no longer work, right? They're not actually displaying the right value. That is because we used hard-coded values for them in the code. So we should go and fix them up as well. I'm actually going to do this by stopping the program. I'm going to do it with you live. Going to the fighter template character. That is where we add all of these. Searching for add input icon to screen and we're going to go through one at a time and instead of passing an index in we're going to pass in the enum 
What we want to put in here instead of this hard coded nine is the actual value that it maps to. So we can type in E input type colon colon and then the specific operation. In this case, this is going to be a backward jump. We will have to convert it to an integer though. So parenthesis int parenthesis. All right. And then same here, this is going to be a forward jump. So in this case, we're going to take away the 10 in the, in the else if here, okay? So we had backward jump, this one's forward jump. So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna do integer e input type e for, whoops, e forward jump. So instead of passing integers in here, we know it's the backward jump, the forward jump. Okay, else is if we're not jumping a specific direction, but we're actually just jumping vertical. So instead of zero, we want int e input type colon colon, and we want e underscore jump. All right, so we have three down. We're gonna click the little arrow here to go to the next one. We're gonna keep going down the list. So we have start crouching. In this case, this is a standard crouch. This isn't a crouch with a direction. So we just want crouch, okay? So int e input type colon colon e crouch. We're gonna go to next. Start manually blocking. Okay, you know what this one is? Int e input type colon colon e block. Gonna go to the next one. Now we have move right. Now these ones get complicated, so we have to be careful here. So in this case, we were adding input icon to screen index one. What we want to do here is we want to trigger this. This is saying we are moving to the right. So instead of one, we're going to int and you know the deal by now input type colon colon e forward. Forward is essentially right in this case. When I made forward and backward input types, yes, they can relate to the actual direction that the player may be moving. But in this case for the input stack, it's the the control that was pressed, not relative to the player, the character's direction, just what the player pressed. So this is going to be a forward press that we want to display to the screen. We can go to the next one. This one is going to be backward. Okay. So integer e input type colon colon e backward and it's okay if you get lost or if yours are in a different order than mine it won't hurt anything you'll just see that it's the wrong input on the screen and what you can do is say oh why is that input displaying wrong and you go look at the icon or, or you go look at the the function call here see what's put in and if it's not displaying properly see if that this is the correct value for the icon that you want to put is backward in the base game instance is it bound to the correct index that is in the array as well? Okay, this is an else, a 12. So this is going to be a, a crouched input, a, a crouched directional. This is going to be a forward crouch in this case. So instead of add input icon to screen, 12, we're going to do integer, and we are going to do e input type e forward crouch and this one should be backward crouch now this is for move right controller which is a different function but we still need to display these properly so another set and we're going to do e input type uh, e forward for the first one here okay and then we're gonna click this again, and guess what? This is the opposite direction, so we do backward. Sorry, first one there. Okay, for 12, this is again the crouched inputs. So this is going to be the E input type, forward crouch, and this should be backward crouch. Now we have our attacks, and the attacks are much easier than the directions. So we can just do int e input type, 
And then this is going to be for the light attack. Okay, because we now start attack one is our light attack. And then start attack two is our medium. So we do E input type. Uh, medium attack. Okay, start attack three is our heavy. I could type, and this is going to be our heavy attack. And then we have our start attack four, which is our special. So we're going to do E input type special attack. And then our macros are the ones that we've already set up previously in this episode. So at this point, we're ready to launch and make sure we got everything right. So let's play the game and let's test it out. I'll show you when we get back into the editor and let's make sure we got all of our inputs right so that the input stacks are functioning as we expect. Okay, the editor is back open. And so now we can play the game again. And if we did everything correctly, we will be able to see the correct input stack icons regardless of what we're doing. So if I crouch, it is down. That is correct. Forward is forward. Backward is backward. Jumping is jumping. Backward jumping is backward jumping. Forward jumping is forward jumping. But light attack, medium, special, and heavy are all correct. Block is also correct. So player two will work the same. Uh, so if we do player two, down, up, back, forward, forward jump. Uh, whoops, backward jump. Crouch, you can see the input stack. If I press down and forward, it's down and forward. And if I press down and backwards, down and backward. It should be the same for player two, and it is. Uh, let's see, light. Forget what all of his controls are. Which one is medium? There's heavy. This is special. And medium. So there we go. So we can see that all the inputs are correct. So at this point, we have finished the tutorial. We now have macros and all of our input stack icons functioning as expected. They all work hand in hand. And that is excellent news. That is exactly what we want to see. So the last thing that we need to set up for macros in the immediate future is the ability to remap them. The players to actually remap them as opposed to be hard coded macros assigned by the game. So we'll get that set up in the next episode and macros will be finished for the most part. We can add additional things if we'd like, but that is a, a completely functional macro system in the fighter template. So anyway, guys, that's all I got for you today. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. So I really appreciate it. I want to give another shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys for everything you've done and for all the assistance you've given me. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm so excited you guys are enjoying this series as much as I am. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. I'd be happy to help you out, get you sorted, get you working on your game again. Like I said, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.